Hello, I'm Bob and I'd like to welcome you to another episode on the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. In this video I'm going to cover how to service the steering stem and forks on the 1980 to 85 series of 16 valve 1100 cc Suzuki motorbikes. Early in 2022, which is currently still this year, I did a major service on my two 1980s Suzuki superbikes, a GSX 1100E and a GSX 1100S, which is also known as the Katana. Forks are slightly different on the two bikes and I'll cover both forks in this episode. The video will cover mainly the work done on the Katana 1100 but where they differ I will show you some excerpts on the work done on the GSX 1100E, the road bike. A lot of the time needed to service the forks and steering stem is taken up just removing all the stuff in the way. Bob has had a lot of practice at this but it still takes him a while. All the work shown here can be done with the bike on the floor, but a lift table makes it just a little bit easier. First, the fairing panels are removed. Then the fuel tank. To free the front wheel, I first removed the brake calipers. On this katana, the mounting bolts were secured with safety wire, which I cut away and then undid the bolts. Before the caliper unit can be moved out of the way, I undo the screws holding the connected anti-dive slave cylinder. Then it is just a matter of freeing the brake hose from its retainer and the caliper is off. Do not leave it dangle by the brake hoses however. I use wire hangers to hold it out of the way. With both calipers out of the way, the front of the bike is raised using a jack, the axle withdrawn and the front wheel removed. With the wheel gone, the four bolts holding the front mudguard and fork brace are removed. And the mudguard unit eased out of the forks and put aside. Bob then sets to work removing the steering stem. The speedometer cable is removed from the instrument pod. 
followed by prying off the covers over the heads of the top clamp bolts and the fork caps. He then undoes the top clamp bolts, after which he loosens the fork caps. Next, he loosens the screws holding the clamp plates for the handlebar. He then undoes the lower clamp bolts and slides both forks down and out of the steering stem. With the forks removed, I then undo the two bolts holding the instrument pod and ignition. Unplug the attached leads and remove them. I then undo the centre clamp bolt on the top bracket of the steering stem and undo and remove the stem head bolt before removing the top bracket. The steering stem on these bikes run on roller bearing. There is a slotted nut screwed onto the top of the steering shaft that both holds the shaft in place and seats and sets the bearing preload. You can butcher it undone with a hammer and a punch, undo it with a C-spanner, or use a special socket. The GSX forks are a little different to the Katana, particularly this model. Uh, the, this is 1980, 1981, 1982 from memory, are all the same, similar to this. And in the 1983 model, they moved to a set of forks which is identical to the Katana with the anti-dive setup. Now, something that's a little different on these is it has air assist forks. You'll also find it handy if you can, rather than undo everything, suspend the instrument cluster and the handlebars above the bike and in this case I have up here an eye bolt conveniently situated so that I can do this. The manifolds for the air pressurization of the street bike forks contain o-rings at the top and bottom and you need to check their condition and replace if necessary. Even if you do not pressurize your forks these need to be in good shape to prevent oil leaking out. The fork tubes also have an opening in them which these manifolds surround. To replace the fork oil and not have it leak out in reassembly, you will need to block these holes 
and here Bob is wrapping PVC tape around the opening area to seal it off. Steering stem's been cleaned. We've got to re-grease the bearings. I'm going to do a check of these, see that it's all turning nicely. We also want to have a look at the bearing cups. Now you can see here, there are marks. Regular marks correspond to the uh, rollers on the bearing. I'm not particularly worried about these because they're just marks. There's no real indent, but something to watch. Have a look at the bottom one. We'll move on to re-greasing the bearings for the steering stem. The top bearing is re-greased in the usual manner, which for me is pushing the base of the bearing into a wad of grease until I see it come out the top and between the rollers and the cage. The bottom bearing is pressed into place and there is a grease seal beneath it. Removing that bearing would damage the seal, so instead I work the grease down from the top, this time looking for grease to be forced out between the rollers and their cage. Bob is now refitting the steering stem. Ensuring the top grease seal is sitting correctly, he winds down the slotted stem nut. Initially, he over tightens the stem nut to seat the bearings and then backs it off. Before using a torque wrench to set the preload tension to 40 to 50 newton meters or 29 to 36 foot pounds, and then backing it off half a turn and checking the free movement. Once the bike is back on the road, Bob will road test and may further adjust the tension depending on its steering tracking. Bob then refits the top bracket to the steering stem, but will leave it loose until the forks are refitted. I made the special socket some years ago by welding a half inch socket to the top of a steel cylinder that fits neatly over the stem nut. I then welded a series of prongs to the outside of the cylinder. The prongs are positioned and of the right thickness to accurately engage the slots at the base of the stem nut. I'm about to replace the pinch bolt on the steering stem. Now, I just wanted to show you something. This is the old spring washer. You can see it's almost flat. This is a new one and you can see one side's above the other side. It's your choice when you replace old spring washers, um, but when I see them go flat, I replace them.
One of the big differences between the Katana and the street bike is the presence of anti-dive units on the front forks. If we look at the fork here, this is the anti-dive unit. There is a plunger that sits on top and when the brakes are applied the plunger depresses this plunger here which lock, blocks off the fluid movement in the forks. And what that means is, or what it's designed to do, is that when you put the brakes on you don't get that dive in the front with the weight transfer. The bike remains essentially level. With the steering stem done, it was onto the fork. I always loosen the fork caps whilst they are still bolted in place on the bike because gripping a fork tube tightly in a vise can distort it. Having a loose fork cap makes its removal by hand later very easy. Of course, remember the fork cap is spring loaded and get ready to catch it when it comes undone. Remove the fork spring and invert the fork over a catch pan to collect the old fork oil and then leave it to drain for a while. The oil itself should have a sump oil appearance, not be milky, not contain metal particles. A check you should also do at this stage is to try and rock the fork tube in the slider at various positions. The fork tube has a bushing at its base and too much play here can indicate wear, indicating that the bushing needs replacement. Inspect the thread on the fork cap for burrs that might cause it to cross thread when refitting and check the thread in the fork tube as well. The fork cap is made of aluminium and is most likely of the two to get damaged. There is an o-ring on the cup that goes beneath the fork cap and this needs to be inspected and replaced if worn or damaged. The fork cap contains the preload adjustment plunger and it pays to set this to the lowest setting ready for the install. This bike has had its suspension sag optimised and spaces have been fitted above a pair of progressive fork springs to set the ride height. And of course, when refitting progressive springs, the tighter coils go to the top. Bob adds about 260 mil of 15 weight fork oil to the leg. After this, he pumps it a few times to circulate the oil before letting it sit in the compressed state to allow the oil to settle. His preferred method for setting the fork oil volume is to set the depth of the airspace above the fork oil with the spring removed and the leg fully compressed. Bob has a special tool to remove excess oil to bring the depth to the level required. Here he is setting the depth of a tube which he lowers into the upright fork and uses a syringe to withdraw the excess oil. Bob has set the fork oil level for this bike at 221mm below the top of the compressed fork tube. Oil volumes will be different depending on your model, so please consult your manual as to the correct volume, weight and fork oil height to use. I changed the position of the fork leg in the vise so it is now fully extended. Making sure that the tight coils were towards the top, I dropped the spring down into the fork tube, followed by the spacer and then the cup, making sure that the flat side of the cup is uppermost. Because of the spring pressure, it is hard to push the fork cap down whilst making sure the fine threads on it and the tube line up and getting the thread engagement started with the spanner. In these conditions it's so easy to get the threads misaligned when turning the fork cap with the spanner. I've found the best solution is to use an impact driver and once the socket is lined up correctly turn it down at a very slow speed. 
I always check that the fork cap still turns easily as cross threading now would make the forks toast. Back at the bike, the fork tube is slid up through the bottom bracket of the steering stem, then the handlebar and finally the top bracket. With the street bike, refitting the forks is a bit more complicated as you need the fork tube to progressively engage the air manifold, a spacer, the headlight cowling mount and finally the top bracket. Make sure that the top of each fork leg is the same distance above the top of the tightened down steering stem bracket. I then position and tighten the half handlebar once the fuel tank is back on the bike, I'll reposition these handlebars to clear it. I then set the distance of the lower fork bracket to be equal distance from a set point on each side of the frame before visually checking to see that the forks are in line across the front of the bike after which I will tighten up the bolts on the steering head, then the fork caps, and finally the top clamp bolts. Thanks for watching, and whilst this video covered the steering stem and fork service, there's still more to do on the front end. In part two of this series, I will be covering how to service the front brakes. Thank you once again for watching, and I look forward to talking to you next time. Bye.